Well, howdy. How are y'all? Good to have you with us. You'll notice something's different. I usually always put this over here. And one of the weekends that I didn't preach, the last couple of weekends, I sat right over there. And I sat with somebody and they said, you never look at us. So, hi guys, hi, are y'all? Okay, anyway, y'all will be neglected for a while because this is here now. So anyway, just fair time, fair look time. Also, um, hi in the theater, we, we did move some things around. I think y'all adjusted for us, but if you had to wait on us, thank you for waiting. Um, we had, um, trying to follow the spirits leading here and, and I hope that uh, y'all did the same. So, um, Welcome. The gal who, how many of y'all have a cup of coffee in your hand that we made? How many of you enjoyed a donut that we provided for you? Debbie Coles is the gal who provides coffee, leads the teams that provides coffee and donuts for you every weekend. And it's her birthday. So in the theater, we've never tried this, but in the theater in here, we're going to try to do a simultaneous birthday song to her. The short one, you know, this is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Hey, you know that one? Okay. Clap with me. One, two, one, two, three. This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Hey. Okay. Happy birthday, Debbie. Over the last several weeks, we've been working through uh, talking about relationships and just how hard they are and where they slip up. We talked about communication and how important it is to be clear and consistent. How, we talked about um, fighting fair. We talked about the physical expression of our love for each other in relationships and how that can sometimes get goofed up. We talked about... Um, Sometimes when the fighting doesn't go as fair as it should, how to extend forgiveness and grace and how to get on the path to repair and reconciliation. We talked about how to trust people and who's worthy of our trust and how to extend honor. Today I want to talk to you about what we're calling necessary endings. A part of the relationship, and we're not talking about ending a relationship completely necess necessarily, it might be that, or it might be that there's just some aspect of the relationship that unless it changes, the relationship cannot be healthy. Moving in and understanding that there are times when things should end. Listen to this. I talked to a, a San Jose police officer this past weekend, or this past week, and he told me that whenever the San Jose Police Department show up at an address for domestic violence. You know, it's really bad if the, if the police are involved. Whenever they show up there, they show up an average of six more times to that address before the relationship ends, before something changes, something gets right. Six more times, an average of seven calls per domestic violence call. There are times when something needs to change. Something needs to end. Something needs to be different. I've called this, the good cannot begin until the bad ends. Henry Cloud, who I unashamedly stole a bunch of stuff from in this message and the, even the, the title, he has a book called Necessary Endings. And as we talk about this, if it, if it, if it sounds like a topic that would be good for you to, to um, get more research in, I highly recommend this book. It's been very helpful for me. He says this, without the ability to end things, people stay stuck, never becoming who they are meant to be never accomplishing all their talents and abilities should afford them. People get stuck. And it's funny because we just, it's very difficult for us to recognize that something needs to change in relationships and that something sometimes needs to stop. And yet this is a very natural biblical perspective about life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the birds in the 60s sang, 
There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill, a time to heal. A time to tear down, a time to build. A time to weep, a time to laugh. A time to mourn, a time to dance. And the passage goes on to talk about scattering stones and gathering stones back up. Basically, there are times and seasons where things begin and are born and things change and end. It is a natural part of the process. But we get stuck. We get stuck for all kinds of reasons. Um, we want to make sure that we're helpful to people. We hang on for a long time out of kindness or out of fear. But we simply get stuck. And when we do that, it puts life's development in some areas on hold. I became familiar with the psychological term learned helplessness through the tragic loss of our youngest son 20 months ago. And I recognized patterns in my own life where I wasn't, I was different. I wasn't moving forward. And someone introduced to me to this idea of learned helplessness. Psychologist Martin Seligman defines it as this. It, learned helplessness, is a condition in which the person adapts to the misery because they feel that there is nothing they can do about it. They believe that their life is totally out of their control. And they just, they just adapt and embrace the misery around them. You will know if this is a part of your life if you're demonstrating the three Ps. The first P is you personalize it. All of the tragic things around are all about you. It's almost as if the world is working against you. It then becomes pervasive. And it's not just in this one relationship that's bad, but it's in everything. Your work's bad, your family's bad, the weather sucks. Everything all of a sudden is tainted by this misery in this area. And then it starts to feel permanent. It's not permanent, but it begins to feel as if you'll never escape it. The change, there's no opportunity ever for change to happen. And if, as you find yourself in this, you find yourself losing the joy, at least for me, I found myself losing the joy and the optimism and the hope that I had in some areas of my life. And I think that relationships can do this to us as well. We can just get stuck and we can adapt to the misery and it can be bad for so long that we just get used to it being bad. And we think that that's just kind of the way it is. Why don't we end it? Why don't we change things? Why don't we make stands? Well, I've, I've come up with some reasons. Some of us have an abnormally high pain threshold for misery. I don't know how else to say this other than you can just put up with a lot of crap. It's because of the way you were raised. It's kind of because of some of the things that happened in your past. You just have a high tolerance for misery. And you see other people's relationship and you see some of the things that are going on and you marvel at the way that they can seem to demand to get some different things. Others have just a, they, they're covering for other people. There, there, there's a misunderstanding here of what love means. And you, you find ways to actually begin to believe that your love is enough. Your love is actually changing them. If you'll love them better, love them longer, love them harder, they'll actually change. Watch this. How many people in the room have been married over 10 years? Gals, when you married him, you were certain that by 10 years, he would at least stop burping at the table. 
And now you have gotten to the point where you're just lucky if he only burps. <laughs> we don't end it because we believe that ending it somehow means that, that I've failed. Or we misunderstand what loyalty means. We think that loyalty and love is giving the person what they want instead of what they need. And then there's what's called codependent mapping, which is feeling responsible for another person's pain um, and, and enabling them to endure it by you carrying things that, you, that are not yours to carry. I think the main reason we don't end things, and I had a good discussion with somebody after the last service, I think the main reason really is we're just afraid. We're afraid of all of the stuff that comes with stepping up, stepping out, and saying, this is what we need for health. And we're afraid how people will respond to that. Now, let me give a disclaimer here. There's a difference between helping someone who's disabled or incapable, infirmed in some way. There's a difference in helping those folks and taking care of someone who is resisting growing up. And, and we're carrying things that they, only they should be responsible for. So if you're in relationships and situations where someone has a disability or has, a, has special needs, nothing that I say is really going to apply to those kinds of relationships. But there are relationships that we have that clearly people are able to do some of the things that we're doing for them. And I just want to assure you, they won't change. As, as long as you'll do it for them, they'll let you. Now, in the research of people who can go through the process of change and endings well, there is one common characteristic across the board in all the research that happens. This is interesting to me. And it's this. The one thing that's, co that's consistent with all of the people who navigate this well is that they, they understand that pain has a purpose versus pain for no good reason. They understand and believe that the hard times that they're going through, in fact, some of the very best things about us today came through some of the very hardest things in our past. And this is a biblical concept that is expected and, and, and taught throughout the scriptures. Romans 5, beginning at verse 3, not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings. That's a crazy thing to say to people. How can you rejoice in your sufferings? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And the same thought, the same lesson is taught in James chapter 1 beginning in verse 2. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's a crazy statement unless there's some kind of purpose behind the pain. And of course, the, pay, the purpose is because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must finish it work, its work in us so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we have, as Christ followers, we have some of the necessary ingredients that are needed for us to be able to embrace the changes that are needed and to move forward with the kind of hope that allows us to be successful in our relationships. But how do you know, how do you know when a relationship is at a place where something needs to change? How can we know if something should end or change? Because the teachings of Scripture say, Proverbs 18 says there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And Proverbs 17, 17 says a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. So if you're supposed to stick in there, stick in there, stick in there, how do you know when you're actually doing damage to the relationship? Good question, right? I call it the pruning moment. How do you know when something needs to change? And it's hoping versus wishing. Here's what hope is. Hope is the desire or the expectation that something can change and some kind of proof or some kind of indicators that tell you that it's going to change. There are grounds to believe that it's going to. 
Hope is the desire for it to change and grounds to believe that it will change. Now watch this. A desire for things to change without grounds that it will change, that's called wishing. And if you're in relationships where when you honestly evaluate what's going on, you're really wishing it would be different, you are now face to face with the pruning moment. Now, Steve, how do you know that something is hoping or something is wishing? Well, it takes some, some kind of wisdom to be able to do this. Henry Cloud said, in the absence of real objective reasons to think that more time is going to help, it is probably time for some type of necessary ending. A question you might ask yourself is this, what reason other than the fact that I want this to work, do I have for believing that tomorrow's going to be different? What reason other than the fact I really want it to work, do I have to believe that this is going to happen? Now, what's your best predictor of the future as you evaluate your relationships? The past. The past becomes your best predict predictor unless something's changing. Now, what kinds of things change that move wishing to hoping? I, I, I wrote out some, so let me just run through them really quickly. There's a verifiable involvement in a proven change process. You just went from wish to hope. There's new or additional structure in their lives that is, that's moving them from wishing to hoping. There's loving accountability and monitoring systems that have been introduced. There's a new experience or a skill that they've gained. There's intrinsic motivation now. You've got their attention. There's an admission of need. There could be a, a presence of support or uh, some skilled help that are hired to come along beside them or some success that is shown. Those things all are grounds that we can still move towards change. But without those kinds of things involved in some way, you're wishing. You're just, you're wishing. You're throwing pennies into the well. I wish, I sure wish. And if you're wishing, you're at the place where there needs to be some kind of a change. And I've called the opportunity for this to change. No more Mr. Bad Guy. Because change does not have to be terrible. It does not have to be terrible. And here's a skill I want to teach you that I think can help us work our way through things. And it's called the method or the skill of self-selection. See, we believe that we have, to, we have to somehow change that person, get that person to understand what's going on, and um, be basically everything for them, their conscience and their, their intelligence, so that they'll understand what's going on. Watch how this works. Let me give you several examples. You have a 16-year-old daughter. We will pray for you. <laughs> she believes that the proper curfew for a 16-year-old is midnight. You give her that curfew you and you grant it to her, but she doesn't come home until 2 o'clock. Normally in that kind of a situation, no one slept in the house. There's fireworks, there's words spoken. There's grounding until age 25. <laughs> All kinds of reaction. What if you were to go to her and say, in order for me to trust you to be out until midnight, we have to have the kind of relationship where you have to honor the time that we agree on. And if you're not going to honor that time, you have to call me beforehand to let me know. And so, I will, do you understand? In order for the rest of the family to get any kind of rest, we have to know you're safe. We have to know that things are fine. It's not that I don't 
I don't want you to be with your friends. It's not that I don't want you to grow up. It's not that, I, that I'm actually the ogre that you think I am. And so here's what I will do. This coming Friday, I will again extend you to the curfew of midnight. You understand, don't you, that you must be in by midnight or call me in advance to tell me what's wrong and what's going on and why you'll be late. You know what your daughter will say? Blessed mother. (laughs) Thank you for ungrounding me to the age of 25. I understand the stipulations of this contract and I will do my very best to honor not only you as a person but midnight as a curfew. And then she strolls in the house at 1.30 without a call. There's no need to get angry. There's no need to scream, throw things, take away things. You simply say, we were clear, weren't we? You self-selected out of the group that gets trusted to stay out till midnight. I didn't do this to you. You self-selected out. You have an employee. Work day begins at 8 o'clock at your place, but he consistently shows up at 8.20. And even when he is in there at 8, he's never ready to work. It takes him several minutes to get his coffee, to go around and say hello to everyone. He's never working at 8 o'clock. You go to him and say, I like you. I think you're valuable to us. Our work day begins at 8. I want you to stay. Do you want to stay? This is what it means to stay. We start at 8. And if he still consistently shows up at 8.20, he self-selected out. You're not the bad guy. Let me assure you, there are things in that person's life that they need to learn. They will not learn as long as they can come to work whenever they want. You're in a dating relationship. Let's make it a guy. A, a, A gal's in a dating relationship with this guy. You like him. In fact, you really like him. You think he might be the one. But you have noticed a consistent pattern in his life. And that consistent pattern is he is financially irresponsible. Whenever he has any kind of money at all, he blows it on silly stuff. Since the past is the best predictor, it would not be inappropriate for you to say, can I see your financial statements for the last two years? That would not be inappropriate if you're going to commit your life to a guy. And as you view them, you realize there are consistent patterns here where anytime he has any margin at all in his his budget, it's blown on all kinds of silly toys. And so you go to that dude and you say, I dig you. I think I think we got a chance to be something special here. But in, just because of my own weaknesses and my own insecurities, I have to have a man who I know I can count on that, I, that will be financially responsible for me and for our family if we're blessed with one. Can you be that man? You know what he'll say? <laughs> I can! I can be that man. And then the next time he gets a raise or he gets a little extra money, he comes home with a paintball gun that he spent 400 bucks on. Listen, he self-selected out. Right? And listen, 
loving that guy, loving that employee, loving that daughter is not giving them what they want irregardless of how they act. It's clearly defining for them what the expectations of the relationship are and then holding them to those expectations that they agree to do. The problem here, honestly, in my own life, the problem here is not that I don't understand the expectations. I'm not brave enough and secure enough in Christ to trust him for all aspects of my life to speak clearly to people what the expectations are for this relationship to continue. I under, listen, I get this. Years ago, not at this church, years and years ago, different job. Because of my responsibilities, my boss said, that guy on your team's done. Let him go. He's done. I had a meeting with him. I thought I fired him. <laughs> but I was so soft and so squishy and so kind that he left thinking we were working on it still. Now, do you, it's really hard to fire somebody. If, if it's not hard in your life to fire people, nobody wants to work for you. <laughs> you know, it, really, it's hard. This is hard. But however hard it is for you, do you know how much harder it is to have a second meeting in the same day to fire a person? It, it's at le I've done it. It's at least 10 times harder to sit there and say, you know, I, I know you thought we could work on this, but we can't. It's, it's not, people deserve better than that. People deserve better than that. And here's what they do. I, I gave you some strategies for ending well, and I just kind of leave those with you. I don't have time to work through all of them, but I want to I highlight one of them. And that is, what we do is, because we, we, didn't, we weren't clear, because we're, we're, we're not as courageous as we need to be, we don't tell the whole truth to people. We tell them about 80% of it. And then when they, don't, when they don't comply to that other 10 or 20%, we got to make them out to be something bad. And so we do what I call bowing up. It's bowing your neck. I, this is an animal term, so I don't know how many of you get this. But it's basically what you do is you kind of, you prepare, you bow your neck. You, you prepare for impact. So you build up straw man arguments and cases against this person, you make them out to be worse than they are so that it can make sense in terms of why they're going. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you bow up and so you explode. So let me tell you, there's people in this room who have been fired poorly. And I'll bet a really prevalent reason is it's because the boss that had to let you go didn't have the courage just to flat out tell you the truth. So they bowed up. So it went terrible. I mean, they don't tell you anything. They just come in, you're gone. No, thank you. We'll take your computer. No, you'll be escorted out by the security. You're done. And they don't say nothing because they don't have the courage to say it. Or they say way more than is even applicable to your situation. And you think, gosh, I thought I, thought I was a pretty good employee for all these years. The way he talked... They've been carrying me for months, right? Because they bowed up. Resist bowing up. Establish what is clear in a relationship. Establish what the changes are that are needed. And then hold them to those changes. Now, in covenant relationships, covenant relationships are marriage, kids, family members, those relationships rarely should end. There are occasions when they should, but they rarely, sh they rarely should completely end. And so what I'm talking about here are the changes inside of a relationship. It shouldn't end like some of the examples I gave, but you still hold them. 
You, you want to you have Thanksgiving at my house this year? Here's the deal. Here's, here's what it looks like for health in my home. You don't park on my grass. <laughs> you don't come drunk. We will, watch, we will not watch pornography while we're at partaking the meal. <laughs> you cannot talk to my children that way. And you got to quit slamming my husband. Oh, that was a little close, huh? <laughs> Do you understand? Do we understand what health looks like? Yes, we understand. We'll park on the street. No porn. We'll leave Debbie Does Dallas at home. I'm just, you know. I'm allowing for all kinds of weird situations. Because my background is a little bit familiar with all of this. And then halfway through the carving of the turkey, someone slams your husband. What did they do? Self-selected out. They're still your mom. <laughs> they just ain't getting any turkey this year. <laughs> and you escort them to the door. Be courageous. As long as you're clear, it's, if you're clear up front, it's easier to be courageous and hold things to it. I'll give you one more example. I didn't, I didn't share this in any of the services. My mom, bless her heart, she, she loved her family, but she was different in her parenting styles than Dana and I. And so we told her, our kids never spent the night with her. And then right before we left Calif Texas to come to California 20-something years ago, she said, would you please let the kids stay? Please let the kids stay one night with me. I said, yeah, mom, we will, but here's the deal. Literally, they cannot get in the car with you to go anywhere. Because my mom drank all the time. She was always drunk. Even though she was a very nice, kind drunk. She, was, she just wasn't a good driver. <laughs> they cannot watch anything that's not PG. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is off the list. <laughs> and they have to be at bed at this time, by this time. Seriously, that's what it was. They, they can stay, can't get in the car, can't watch that stuff, and in bed by this time. And she, absolutely, I can do those things. Now, our kids came home with some new words. <laughs> but we forgot that one. <laughs> All right. Healthy relationships. Healthy relationships are sustainable. And sustainable, sustainable is a way. If you look at it in the dictionary, there's a definition that has to do with how you use resources. And it's, it's using and managing resources in such a way that they, do, they are not completely depleted or damaged. There are some of you that are in relationships that on your present course, you will either get completely depleted and have to get rid of people. Or you'll be damaged. Some of your relationships are unhealthy to the point where you're going to be damaged if you stay in them on its present course. Something needs to change. There is a necessary ending in your future. Stop wishing. Recognize what it is. It's not that you don't have enough energy. It's not that you're getting older. It's not that you're a bad person or that you don't love Jesus. You're just in a relationship that cannot be sustained. But 
with Jesus, everything is possible. The heritage that I was grown up in was alcoholism, drug use, and unfaithfulness. It's what my parents were. It's what their parents were. I don't know how many generations you have to go back to find a marriage that lasted over 10 years. But with Jesus, the old is gone. And the new has come. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope in every relationship that Jesus is brought into. By his grace, through our faith, we can be changed. Let's pray together. God, I ask that you would give us wisdom. The kind of wisdom that will allow us the ability to navigate through an evaluation process of our key relationships in our life. Thank you for the ones that we have that are healthy, that are sustainable, that are more than that, that are energizing and, and build into us. Thank you for helping us work through the hard times in those relationships. Thank you for promising to be with us through the hard times that are still ahead. It's possible, God. And only each person can know by the promptings of your spirit, but it's possible that you're moving in a way where some things have to be identified and changed for your people to be your people. Help us with that process. God, I, I beg for my brothers and sisters and friends in the room over in the theater, I ask that you would give them wisdom to navigate this and then courage to face it well. And then finally, God, I ask you, I, I mean, I praise you, I thank you for the truth of Christ in our life and the change that is possible because of him. May he have more and more of our hearts and may our relationships and how we treat people reflect our love for him more and more. For your kingdom's sake, for our city's sake, for our sake, in Jesus' name, amen.